lumbar radiculopathy is exceedingly common. And if you look at back pain, it's the second most common reason people seek medical attention. Lumbar radiculopathy is probably the most common subtype of back pain. And on history, a typical history would involve a patient getting into some sort of traumatic event with some residual back pain and radiating leg pain. Frequently, lay people will consider that sciatica, whether it's really the sciatic nerve or not, depends on the situation. So on history, you have some sort of traumatic event leading to back pain and radiating leg pain. And if you're looking for one unifying explanation for a patient coming to your office with both back pain and leg pain and a traumatic event, lumbar radiculopathy or lumbar radiculitis should absolutely be considered. Physical exam can be helpful too. Back pain, tenderness along the paraspinal muscles, occasionally some very subtle weakness in the hip flexors or subtle weakness in dorsiflexion or plantar flexion depending on which nerve root is involved, and possibly some diminishment in reflexes. A very cursory workup could include an x-ray of the low back to make sure nothing post-traumatic occurred, no fractures. But working it up beyond that with an MRI would really indicate to you that it is in fact nerve irritation typically from a disc. At that point, treatments are readily available but not often necessary. Conservative treatment for a lumbar radiculopathy with minimal to no sensory motor involvement can be as conservative as you want it to be. You could use medications, you could use ice, you could use nothing at all. If pain is intractable, medications like neuropathic pain medications, opiates, non-steroidals can all be used. If pain still remains intractable, very simple office procedures like epidural steroid injections can be used. And if neurologic deficits ever appear, I think it's always reasonable to get a neurosurgical evaluation. Conservative management is certainly acceptable when it comes to back pain and even lumbar radiculitis. Without sensory or motor deficits or without saddle anesthesia, without bowel bladder incontinence, you're not obligated as a physician to really do anything aggressive. Making the patient comfortable, pain medications, certainly a reasonable approach. But if pain remains intractable and patients don't like the idea of masking the pain with an anti-inflammatory, an opiate, or even a neuropathic pain medication, getting an MRI is extremely valuable for treatment options. It sort of opens up your arsenal of treatment options. Epidural steroid injections are fantastic, but really, you want to see nerve compression or at least nerve irritation on MRI so you know exactly where to put the medicine. If you were a neurosurgeon who's doing a surgery, for example, a discectomy on a patient for excruciating pain, an MRI is invaluable. And that patient in excruciating pain does not necessarily have sensory motor deficits. The patient simply might have intractable pain. In terms of why, MRI might be contraindicated or not indicated initially. I think it's just because about 80 plus percent of patients with acute lumbar radiculitis improve back to baseline within six to eight weeks. If pain persists beyond that time, I think it's fair to say most practitioners and most spine societies and governing bodies would feel that MRI is reasonable to open up those treatment options.